Well, welcome everyone today uh, for today's PISA workshop on helping students navigate graduate school options. For those of you that I haven't met, my name is Brianna Suarez and I'm the International Admissions and Operations Manager here, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, otherwise known as APSIA. So today's topic, as I just mentioned, is gonna be focusing on helping students navigate graduate school options. And I am joined today by two great graduate students from APSIA member schools. The first, Krista McSwain, who is a Charles B. Rangel International Affairs Fellow and graduate student at the U Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, as well as Michelle Casanova, who is a graduate student at IE University School of Politics, Economics, and Global Affairs. So we have a couple of questions lined up for them to answer on how they chose their programs, cost, funding, and a lot of those sorts. But I do invite you all to write any and all questions that you may have in the chat. We will have a short and brief Q&A section. So again, when you have the questions, we will make sure to answer them before the end of this event. Um, so I welcome Krista and Michelle to just say hi and quickly introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Kristen McClain. As Brianna was so nice to introduce, I'm a student at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a current 2023 Wrangell Fellow. And at SIFE, I'm currently studying statecraft, strategy, and security um, as my functionality and with a regional focus on China. Hi, everybody. Um, as Brianna mentioned, uh, my name is Michelle Casanova. Um, I am Currently a master's student studying at IE University um, in Madrid, Spain, and I am uh, focusing on um, combating gender-based violence uh, with a regional focus in Latin America, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Michelle. Um, before we start, I would like to encourage you all to turn on your cameras, and when the time comes, uh, ask your questions via the speaker. Uh, you don't have to, this is not necessary, but we would love to see those lovely faces again, so we're not just talking into a void. Um, but let's start with a couple of questions for our panelists. So uh, as you both mentioned what you're studying, they're very specific. Um, so we're just curious, how did you all, how did you both choose your programs? Again, they are very, very topical, very niche. So uh, how did you come across these programs? And I'd like to add on to that, how did you prepare for such specific topics? Um, and we'll start with Michelle, because you're the first one on my screen. Great, thank you. Um, I guess I came across the IE University's um, International Relations Program, uh, specifically it's Master's in Inter uh, International Relations Program, um, actually through Fulbright. It was listed as a, a Fulbright master's options. So I applied to that Fulbright um, and unfortunately I didn't get it. I was a semi-finalist, but um, the program and Fulbright really introduced me to this university in Madrid. And as I got to research it more, um, specifically its regional and thematic focuses, I realized how um, applicable it could be to kind of what I wanted to uh, focus on in addition to its uh, capstone and, and thesis uh, options. So the more I kind of explored that for my application, the more I uh, really found it interesting. So yeah, that's that's basically how I found it and, and why I like it. Thank you, Michelle. Krista? So as for my functionality in regional focus, um, well, excuse me. So in undergrad, I was an IR major and I, well, I double majored in Chinese and IR. So these were subjects I was already really interested in. And before applying for grad school, I originally thought I wanted to be a law school student. And um, wonderfully enough, I was coming to an office event the summer before. I went to the diversity forum, I believe. And I talked to Parliament. I think I actually talked to you, Brianna. And I got to explore a lot of different options and learn more about the organization. From there, I started researching different grad schools. And one of the important things was I had a lot of custom, like I was able to customize what I was learning at uh, during my grad school program. And SICE allowed a lot of that customizability. And so that's why I ended up choosing SICE. But I knew I could find a program that was niche to what I wanted to learn. 
Thank you. And just to get a little bit more in depth about the programs you're currently in, what are some of the courses that you're taking and how do you see them fitting into your professional goals? I know this is a question that we often get from current students. They kind of don't understand how to look forward. So again, how are the courses that you're taking, whether currently or the ones that you're planning forward to take in the future semesters, how do they fit into your professional goals? Um, and we'll start with Krista again, because you're on my screen. Uh, well, this semester I'm taking a lot of my core courses, but I wanted to go ahead and get those out of the way. And But that's also one of the things I did like about Site School. I'm taking a lot of statistics and econ courses. I wanted to have more quant experience, and that was a lot of their core courses. And then I, in the past, I've taken classes on security and foreign policy with Congress and uh, general Chinese studies of how their political scene is looking like right now. So once again, it's a really customizable course. So a lot of the core classes are just making sure you get your general basics done. And then from there, you get to choose what you're more interested in for your program. Um, I, as a Wrangell Fellow, I'll be going into the Foreign Service as a generalist. So I wanted to be able to choose a program where I was going to be able to explore a lot of more general topics that I knew I would be able to apply in a lot of different ways in my career in the coming years. Thank you, Krista. Michelle? Thank you. Um, I guess in my program, uh, my thematic focus, I decided to choose uh, global governance and human rights, and regional focus was Latin America. Um, similarly, Krista, I also studied uh, international relations in my undergrad at, at American University. So I wanted to kind of explore some new topics in IR that I hadn't uh, studied in undergrad. Obviously, IR is such a huge field that you could study it in many masters and a PhD. So um, uh, that's the, that track really um, called to me, uh, especially because I want to work in uh, the realm of NGOs and nonprofits. So uh, some uh, class that I'm taking right now is actually uh, a class on NGOs and, and partnerships and kind of learning how um, NGOs navigate uh, different partnerships uh, with various stakeholders and how some of the challenges that they have to face um, and also some sustainability uh, partnerships that they can make. So um, that track really called to me because it, it was very applicable to what I wanted to go into right after. So that's an interesting class I'm taking right now. Thank you both. And I kind of want to backtrack because you both mentioned some really great programs that I also want to put uh, turn attention to our advisors to the Charles B. Rangel Fellowship Program, as well as the Fulbright Program. So definitely look those up if you're not familiar with those. But I want to kind of take us back to those days in our under in your undergraduate uh, career, right? Um, you might not have thought about graduate school at that point, but clearly you found the Fulbright and you found Charles B. Rangel Fellowship Program. So I'm kind of curious, what led you to apply to graduate school? What led you to first look out for programs like the Rangel, like Fulbright, and how were you able to connect the interests that you had? Um, for example, for you, Michelle, gender-based violence being one of your interests, Krista, general IR, and being part of the State Department. How were you able to figure out these interests as early as on, as early on as in undergraduate as a senior or as a sophomore, a junior. Uh, Michelle, if you don't mind going first, again, you're on my screen. Thank you. Um, I think I had a really amazing team of advisors at American. Uh, specifically, we had an Office of Merit Awards and they were responsible for um, pushing when those deadlines were to apply and, and making sure that uh, students had the ability to meet one-on-one -on -one with advisors to um, discuss different opportunities. Um, and for example, I applied for the Truman when I was a sophomore, and at that point I wanted to go to law school. So um, very, very different focus. And then um, my 
junior year, I applied for the Gilman Scholarship and I got it. So I was able to um, study abroad in Spain and I really wanted to solidify my Spanish because I, I wanted to work with uh, refugees uh, at the time from Latin America and then um, applying to the Fulbright last year was when I was really able to um, narrow down my focus on gender-based violence and um, supporting uh, families and women who are refugees from Latin America. So I think really starting off early uh, in my undergrad career helped me to narrow down what I wanted to study and, and specifically uh, even my career path, what I wanted, what internships I wanted to apply to. And, and um, especially for the Truman, it's I think it's very important for students to have government experience. So I may, was sure to try and find an internship in that, in the public service uh, field. So um, I think, yeah, just starting off early, um, working with advisors, making sure students know that advisors are available is, is essential and having that marketing um, consistently, especially for deadlines uh, was, was very key in, in shaping that path for me. Thank you, Michelle, by the way. Um, I fully agree with Michelle. I think starting early is always best. Just trying to, I'm honestly naturally a kind of nervous person, so I'm always kind of scared to go out there, but trying to get the experience of going out there as much as possible always helps because the more you go out there and learn, the more you'll figure out what you do and don't like. I'm originally from Tennessee. I went to the University of Memphis for undergrad. We didn't have a very large IR program at all. So things like Fulbright and Truman and all the CSIS and different programs were never heard of at Memphis. Um, I would like to think of my journey as kind of like a series of happy little accidents. I was supposed to study abroad because I was a COVID student the first two years. And then my stay abroad got canceled. And then I found myself in DC. And from DC, I ended up at like foreign policy for America events and then eventually at the events and then I found out about Wrangell and then grad school and Aptia. So but it, throughout that the more events I found and went to uh, the more I just got comfortable with cold calling people and doing cold calls on LinkedIn and email and getting that parent always helped me find out more like what I should go to next and really trying to create that network. Because the one thing I've learned with the IR community is that they're always willing to leave that door open for that next person. So going through there and learning more has really, really helped me find what my interests were and that next step to jump to to figure out what I need to do. Thank you both. And I think in both of your responses, you highlighted how things that you expected to do kind of led you to the thing that you ended up really liking and the ability to explore and kind of roll with the punches, which I think a lot of students tend to get nervous about and uh, think that there's only one path into whatever field that they're interested in, especially within IR. But there's a great question based on your both of your answers. Um, Michelle, so you talked about advisors and starting early. So one of the questions we often have advisors ask is kind of just how do advisors even get the attention of students, right? I know from working with our advisors and working with colleagues, they're often so eager to connect with students and kind of let them know that these resources are available, but some may not be as proactive, right? May not actually go to these office hours, go to their advisors outside of the normal academic planning. So how can an advisor get the attention about these opportunities uh, for undergraduate students? Um, and then the same question to you, Krista, how can advisors, in, in your opinion, get the attention of undergraduate students? And I would even say for now for graduate students uh, that are currently studying. So Krista, we'll start with you. I mean, I'm never against uh, just a good, bold, like large mass email of program. I love getting weekly emails of current opportunities of going on. I also think advisors using other students to help students is always really helpful. I know after I would do events, my school and my advisors would have these other small groups of students. So I think just trying to make a comfortable space where students are willing to connect and often opening that line of communication is always the first next step. I know when speak with other freshmen sophomores, they feel nervous speaking to their advisors or they're like, I want to make sure I'm going in with questions, but just making it known that you can come in completely lost and they're willing to be there to help you is always really helpful to them. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah, similarly, I think newsletters are sometimes 
they work. <laughs> like they, especially for very like motivated students, um, I think who are willing to browse through the opportunities that can be important. Um, social media, obviously we're young people. So that that is um, key in addition to seeing other students' success stories uh, is something that can be extremely motivating. Um, especially if you see someone uh, maybe with a similar background or from a similar area in the U.S. or if you're an international student um, and, and hearing about those experiences that can, you don't know who that can motivate. So, um, and I would say even hosting events at, at universities, uh, bribing students with food is like <laughs> it can work really um so yeah I think that's a great way to have I mean transitioning from the COVID era that's a great way to really personally connect with students and um really give them that that introduction to to all these wonderful programs that that are being offered Thank you both. And I can attest to that. Bribing students with food is always a great way to get them through the door. I attended many events during undergrad and graduate school that just solely advertised free pizza or free bagels. So I am a proponent of free food. Um, so going towards the application process, I know graduate school applications can seem very daunting. And sometimes it's even hard to just advise students through the whole process because they're applying to so many schools, they're applying to so many different programs. Can you talk to us a little bit about your own application process, right? How long, what was the timeline for you, the process of finding the programs that you were applying to, the number of schools you might have applied to, any information or details that you can provide us on your application process would be great. And then a second tier question on that is what was the most difficult part of the application process for you? Whether it's the short timeline, whether it's the amount of schools, whether it's the writing, whatever it may be, what would what would you say would be was the most difficult part of applying to graduate school? I will start with Michelle. Thank you. Um, I would say the process of applying to grad schools for me was a bit nerve-wracking because uh, when I was doing the Fulbright process um, in order to uh, like go on to the next uh, stage you have to have an acceptance letter from the grad school so um, that's something that my advisor was telling me like reminding me you have to apply um, and here at IE it's a rolling admission so you can apply whenever which is nice However, uh, if you have a deadline, um, you can, like, if you don't have a deadline, you can procrastinate it a lot. So that is uh, something that I did. <laughs> but um, I applied to only, only um, IE University, actually. And that process, I would say the most, there were two difficult components. Um, one of them was the uh, letter of recommendations, uh, especially for students transitioning from the COVID era to now. A lot of faculty student relationships have been uh, a bit constrained. There haven't there hasn't been that space to uh, really make those close connections. So I found myself maybe reaching out to professors that I had two years ago uh, who I met before COVID or, or maybe that I just um, had as in, in a class, but I asked them for three letters of recommendation already because I'm applying to different uh, like jobs and, and other things. So that was, it was difficult to find those faculty members. Um, and then the exams, were a bit tough for me, um, specifically because I uh, went to interna uh, international school uh, outside the U.S. So, um, I, i.e., they have a, an exam that is specific to the school, and you can only take it at times in Spain. So, I actually woke up at four in the morning 
and had a coffee and chugged a Red Bull and I took an exam at four because that was the time it was offered in, in Madrid. So that was like, I was like, I don't know if I did my best, you know, but um, aside from those two elements, I think pretty standard writing essays and et cetera that, that I think students are, are familiar with. Thank you, Michelle. Krista? So I'm thinking about the timeline. I think I, I, remember I had my LSAT book and I canceled at the end of June. So I think about from mid-July and then I turned in my final grad school application November 1st. I did early admission for both the grad schools I applied for. And I was doing them in tandem with the Wrangell application. So even though, even if I didn't get Wrangell, I knew I wanted to go to grad school. So it was just a lot pumping a lot of essays out at one time. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big planner person. So before I even applied, I wanted to make sure I knew where I was going to apply to. And so I, I tried to write it down, but I knew finances, testing, where I could get good school opportunities and networking opportunities and location were the five things that were most important to me. And so I think for student recognizing what's most important to them in a grad school is something they should kind of figure out before wanting to like step forward. And then once again, there's a lot of cold calling. I actually attended the Axia office hours that they have every month. So I spoke to Brittany about her grad school journey. I, I called you, I called Carmen and multiple other people in my network to go learn more about their experiences and how they like their grad school and why or why not. And so that was kind of my process of going through. So I think by October, I had finished most of my essays and then I had gotten my recommendation letters to have them turned in by November 1st. Um, and once again, that was for early admissions. I know most aren't due to like December or, all, or January or like rolling admissions, but I think that was my time. I wanted to make sure I knew exactly what I wanted. So I made a clear framework and I was also talking to my advisors and professors and what they thought would be most appropriate for me. And before trying to make sure I had my application and the application part, was, that part was easy because I knew my why at that point of what I was going to do. But I think the most difficult part of that was also the imposter syndrome. Like, I know what I wanted. I know what I want my next step to do. But trying to persuade myself that I was good enough to also apply for these things to go into that next step, which I feel like can be really difficult for students in, like, my generation. Thank you both. I mean, you both clearly were so on the ball and knew exactly what you wanted to do. Um, but thank you, Krista, specifically for that point on the why. I think it's sometimes very hard for students to know the why. And I think advisors also struggle, right, to identify uh, the students why they don't know the why. So I think that's where advisors can come in and help, right, to try to discern the student's ultimate goal uh, in emerging into the workforce, the ultimately the why. So on the advisor front, did either of you actively go to your advisors, whether an undergrad or, and I won't even say just advisors, but I'll say, you know, mentors to help you guide you and help you discern the why? Did you actively seek out some help? Um, and in your opinion, how can advisors start to figure out whether they should recommend graduate school? to students, right? Because many students may not even be thinking about graduate school and undergrad. They may be thinking of just going to the workforce immediately. Um, so how can advisors, in your opinion, start to figure out whether they should recommend graduate school to students? Um, and I'll let either of you start us off if you have a, an answer ready. I'm happy to jump in. I think I was really lucky. I had the same advisor from freshman year to senior year. Um, so I had two main advisors. One taught all my IO courses, one taught all my Chinese courses. And so I was in constant contact with these people. But a large part of my advising appointments that I had every semester was they would help them create smart goals. They were like be specific and measurable and everything. So they made sure that I was sitting there thinking about it. And I think they started that around my sophomore, junior year. So I think starting the question early, because you can always change your mind. Changing your mind is like a human thing. As long as it's on your mind, that always helps you discern it. And then I think also having mentors really, really helped. I was lucky to be in contact with the organization called WCAP, and I was talking to a lot of women in IR and their experiences that also helped me figure out maybe what I was wanting to go for and hearing what they did and like, would like and what I should check out also really helped me. Yeah, I um, I 
didn't. I I think um in the beginning of my uh, undergrad, like I didn't have really sustainable advisors to start me out with and and then to finish my um my degree with, but I had a really excellent conversation with um my uh career advising uh, team uh, specifically through the school of international service at au um, david fletcher he's amazing but he basically uh told me that uh, we we went through what i'm interested in what i'm passionate about and i told him i wanted to go to grad school and uh he, he really outlined um the aspect of uh, funding for me, which was crucial because um, I think there are students who would like to go to grad school, but um, taking a critical perspective on that, um, you know, if you're coming out of your undergrad with uh, student loans already and you want to study in the US um, and, and take out more loans, um, and I think students expect to have uh, an a extremely elevated salary because they have a master's degree and without any work experience, that might not be the case. So really understanding that um, helped me to transition my focus from uh, wanting to study in the US versus looking at European universities, which were a more affordable option to me in that moment. So uh, I think the funding aspect to me was 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 very importantly highlighted. Thank you. And there's actually a question already about funding. So I'll I'll touch on that in a second, but I just wanted to interject on one piece of advice that I often give undergrads, even if they're not thinking about graduate school, is to just take the GREs or, you know, at the very least, as early as possible, because they are good for five years. So even if you're not looking to graduate or to go to graduate school immediately, you might change your mind in a year, you might change your mind in two years. And it's very different to study for your GREs when you're currently an undergrad versus studying for them when you're a working professional and completing a nine to five. I know for me, it was very difficult to kind of come back from work, cook dinner, and then have to study for the quant section. Um, so I always recommend, and I really advise advisors to recommend, you know, if you are thinking about graduate school in the near future, in the near future, excuse me, think about taking a couple of practice tests of the GREs. And at least if you take the GREs, you have those test scores available for the five years. You don't have to worry about that component in graduate school. So Michelle, you specifically talked about funding uh, and how you chose IE because of the funding portion. And Krista, vice versa, I will also say the Wrangell program provides full funding for your graduate studies. So Michelle, I'll start with you. How, and you mentioned how important it was um, to find funding. What was your process in looking through for funding opportunities for graduate school? Uh, how intricate was it? How long did you look through all the opportunities? What resources did you utilize to find funding, both here in the U.S. and while you were looking for graduate schools abroad? And then similarly, Krista, the question for you will be, you know, how did you do your research for the and find the Wrangell opportunity? Um, were there other fellowships that you looked at into and applied to? Um, and were the interests that you had in your future career, was that like the main driver? or was funding the main driver for your research? Um, and we'll start with you, Michelle, if you don't mind. Sure thing. Um, where to start? <laughs> um, I guess when I was looking at, uh, yeah, the IE program uh, that was in conjunction with the Fulbright Fellowship, so that would have completely um, funded that. And so I had to look at the possibility um, that if I got in, um, I could easily get into the university, but not get the um, Fulbright, which is what ended up happening. Um, and so 
um, really looking into some scholarships that the university offered helped uh, helped me significantly. Um, and in addition to, it, it was a bit um, tough to figure out uh, student aid at a foreign university, especially because a lot of loans or um, need-based aid doesn't apply to universities outside the US. So that was something else I had to consider. Um, but I, I suppose I ended up graduating a bit early. So I worked a full-time job and I was able to save up enough um, to pay my way through my uh, grad school. And it's a one-year program. So uh, once I finish, I can resume working again. Um, but that was something that um, I had to consider was that loans weren't really an option for me uh, at a federal level, um, maybe from a private bank, but that wasn't an option I was interested in. So um, yeah, that's kind of how my how my funding journey is this one. Thank you, Michelle. Krista? Yeah, so I think by like junior year of undergrad, I kind of knew I but some way or somehow I was going to go to some kind of graduate program. I would be law school, maybe a graduate school like where I am now. So I was lucky to have the GI Bill. So I actually saved my GI Bill from undergrad so I could use it to help fund my graduate school journey. So I knew that I had that funding, but I knew it was over the budget. I would probably have to use some kind of loans and I was prepared for that. But then that summer before my senior year is when I found the Rango program just through conversations with other people um, for I guess some people who don't know it, a program where they help pay for two years of grad school and then you serve five years with a foreign service. And that was just really attractive to me because I had always wanted to become a foreign service officer. So hearing this, like all the lights went off. I was like, this is perfect. And I was really driven by the position. And then I found out about the funding later. I was like, double whammy. This is great. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of programs kind of similar to this, the Wrangler and Pickering and Payne and a lot of other similar programs that I definitely encourage students to look at if they think public service is where they're going to go. There's a lot of public service internships and fellowships, like similar ones nowadays for students to look at. So I think that's something to look at for sure. And that's also, if I had gotten a previous position, we also with IAWJ, she's like, if you're going to grad school, I recommend having an idea where you want to go afterwards and then looking at to see what programs also have can maybe help students. Right? Like there are a lot of companies and organizations that are willing to help students. So. I think I was driven by the position and then funding was always an afterthought, even though I did recognize it was a very important step to have and wasn't that so journey. Thank you both. And I think I want to highlight kind of the fact that you both were in similar paths, but funding wise kind of went different paths ultimately. Mm -hmm. But what I want to highlight here is the idea of understanding how you were going to fund your graduate studies early on even before you applied to, to graduate school, whether you got the Fulbright or didn't, whether you got Wrangle or not, right? Having an understanding of the commitment funding-wise financially is was very important to you both um, in your application. So that's something that I wanna stress with advisors, right? We have to be clear with our students of what it means, not just the academics portion of it, but the funding portion of graduate school and looking into any and all opportunities available to fund graduate school studies. Sometimes it may be out of pocket. Sometimes you have the pleasure of get and the honor of getting some of these great programs, but not everyone will. So thinking through other options like Michelle did, right? Of thinking of other options outside of those fellowships uh, that you, they may not get of how to fund those studies is incredibly important and getting our students to think that way is important through the process. Um, and so I also want to ask, you know, um, how can advisors best support students? Not every student is going to come to them and say, you know, I'm applying to graduate school. They may not even know. So what is the best piece of advice that you think you could give advisors about the application process itself um, to share with their students moving forward? And I'll let either of you, we can ruminate on that point for a quick minute, uh, but I'll let either of you jump in. Uh, when you have an, an, a quick answer.
I would say to advisors probably just to really go through your options um, and see how they align with with whatever the students' goals are, short term and long term. Um, maybe uh, <clears throat> one day I might be uh, considering to do a PhD, and that was a, a long term goal of mine. But um, short term, I knew that I really wanted a master's. So um, kind of considering that and, and considering whether or not you want to go right into the workforce or if you want to take some time to go into grad school um, is, I think, is a really important thing to address with your, uh, that advisors need to address with, with students, especially if, um, like you were saying, Brianna, like it's important to have that GRE exam ready, or or if um, a student takes time off, if they really think that they will want to go back to grad school after taking that time away from studying. So there is, I think, that component of, of the timing, the funding, short-term and long-term goals, and um, yeah, just just uh, location for me was was an extremely important part of my journey. Um, I knew that I wanted to study abroad and, and um, also advance my language skills. And, and I had different kind of objectives uh, outside of grad school that, that kind of complemented my career goals, um, especially um, I wanted to be close to international organizations uh, in the EU. So that was something that I considered. So location as well. And, and I think having uh, like an international perspective on that can be helpful for students. Um, specifically, I think sometimes um, in the U.S. we think like this is the only place we can ever be. Um, but I think um, studying abroad uh, for grad school or even um, looking into uh, fellowships like uh, I think I don't remember what exactly the, the name of the fellowship is where you can study a year abroad uh, in grad school and then study one in the US. But that could be a really, um, it, it'll come back to me, but that, that could be a really great opportunity as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my piece of advice. <laughs> No, you pointed out some great points. The idea of short and short term and long term goals for students. So having advisors walk them through just what those may be and the ability of studying abroad as well, not just graduate school in the US. I know many students tend to get focused on just US schools, but there are many great schools that have school that have programs abroad and US universities that have partnerships with schools abroad. So you are able to study one year, for example at IE and then the next year at Columbia SIPA in New York City. So those are possibilities for students um, that further their goals, for example, for you, Michelle, to advance your Spanish. So that's always great. Um, Krista. Sorry, I just remembered oh, the yes, name. It was the, the Born Fellowship. Ah, yes, the Born Fellowship. <laughs> Thank you. Also a great resource to share with your students. Uh, Krista. Um, I think <laughs> I think it's most exactly the same thing. Like the best thing that advisor can do is have these conversations early and be honest. Um, I think one of the best things my uh, advisor did for me was just have really candid conversations. A lot of times it wasn't just like, you're going to do this and then this is going to happen. It was just a, well, why are you wanting to do this? Tell me more about this. Like one of those you can lead a horse to water, but they have to drink. So that by them asking me these questions, it may be forcing them to really research more so I could come back with confident answers. And a lot of times my answers even change by doing this research. So trying to support students by wanting them to also push to see what they're interested in and be like, hey, by the way, like I see you're interested in this, but X, Y, and Z is hard. That application can be difficult. Or looking at GPAs, like maybe these should be your next step. Just being honest and having sometimes those hard conversations can help the student more than anything. Thank you. That's also a great point, Krista, of just having those honest conversations with students of where they're at and how to get to those goals that they have and how to prepare 
on their way to those goals, right? They may not have all of the courses available to them to get X degree, but if we start looking at ways to expand our skills, whether it's joining after curricular, after, <laughs> after curricular, extracurricular activities, whether it's volunteering, there are other ways outside of the academics that students can prepare for graduate school and careers beyond. So having those conversations and getting students to think, again, back to Michelle's point and Chris's point, ultimately, the short-term goals and their long-term goals is a great way to get them thinking and start getting them prepared for what's to come in the future. Um, and especially on the funding front too, I would say having that honest conversation of, you know, graduate school is expensive. Have you thought about studying abroad for graduate school? Have we thought about exploring all these other options? So great points from, from both of you ultimately. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop on the questions on our end. Um, I do encourage our advisors that are online right now to put any and all questions you may have in the chat or if you're so bold, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and ask the question directly. These are two great people and resources on the graduate school of application and process as they're both still current graduate students. So please ask any and all questions. Um, we are here to be of service. And yay, we have our first speaker. Uh, please, Daniel, take it away. Thank you so much, Brianna. And thank you so much for the panel for all the great information. I've been really getting a lot out of it. So I appreciate you all taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I often struggle with students who are very adamant about wanting to go directly into grad school as soon as they get their bachelor's degree. And uh, they usually don't have a lot of uh, work experience kind of going into their field. Uh, so my first question would be, how critical is that work experience for once students obtain their graduate degree to find employment? And do you often find um, instances of when you kind of struggled with kind of bottlenecking yourself and when you once you go into graduate school, like that's going to be my specialization. It was right up in the panel yesterday that it's kind of like there are a lot of different uh, positions often recruit for people with degrees that may not necessarily be associated with what they're doing. I just wanted to maybe get some of the panelists feedback on situations like that may that may have arisen with you or any other um, uh, colleagues that you may have experienced it. Thank you. Well, I'm personally oh, happy to, I'm happy to oh, please, Michelle, or oh, Krista. Oh, right? no, please, Brian, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 please, <laughs> no. Um, As for work experience, I graduated in December, so I only had one semester before going into grad school. So at that time, I kind of was uh, just like a regular full-time job, but I think now I see a lot of people who have had it like before and some who had. I was looking to have a lot of internships before going to grad school, so I think that was one benefit. I think having not worked at all would have kind of done me a disservice. No internship, no kind of job, no fellowship before going to grad school would have been more difficult because I do see now how having some kind of experience has helped me um, in just my core courses and everything. But I also think it sh if you're having a student who has had no work experience at all, it's also a discussion of will they be willing to work during grad school? Like, are they willing to pursue different internships during that time and also try to get that experience so they can grow during that time in a different manner. Because I think like growing professionally one way and growing academically, although it can sometimes be intertwined, can sometimes also be very different. You can learn different skills in different ways. Um, and then as for the boxing yourself in, personally, I'm one of those never box yourself in anything. I chose my degree first because I was interested in these topics, but I also realized I wanted to kind of be a generalist. And I would be interested different interested in different things. So I'm going into public service, but just last semester I had an internship with a private consulting firm. So I think you should encourage your students to explore things even if they're not fully interested in or even have a slight interest in, you they'll change their mind and have that different experience can be very helpful. Yeah, I um I completely agree with everything what Krista said and um yeah, I think having some internships can really be um, critical into deciding whether or not to, um, or even uh, teaching assistant positions, um, any part-time positions during um, undergrad could be uh, just really substantive into knowing whether or not to move into um, grad school or not. Uh, specifically, I think, letting your student know that if they don't have maybe one or two internships under their belt or um, any part-time experience or even um, experience with 
uh, community organizing or doing some advocacy work or organizing on on their campus that that could tell a story some leadership positions um but if if they have maybe are, are lacking some of that experience just letting them know if you come out of grad school um and you and you're not getting accepted to any jobs it you might have to start looking into internships um and that is a very real reality that I think um right now I'm I'm talking to some of my peers and um they are looking into internships after grad school because um yeah if you have a master's but you're competing with people who have two or three years of job experience under their belt it's you know, who, who are they going to pick? So I think just letting the students know that that is a reality, but if they don't necessarily have work experience, but they have different other experience that they can really um, expand on, that that can be really critical as well. So um, just having those honest conversations. And I'm actually going to jump off something that Michelle just said that I think is extremely important to have our students think through. And I know it's something we're gonna talk about in our next uh, panel at 4 p.m. Um, and it's just thinking about outside opportunities, outside of the traditional nine to five jobs, right? Having them volunteer, having them have, you know, local organizational volunteer experiences, things like that. Again, the local to global kind of thing uh, that we'll be talking about, having experiences that are not necessarily working in an office nine to five can be considered work experience or professional experience in a resume. And it's something that uh, graduate schools are often looking for. Um, on the putting on my APSIA hat, we often recommend students take at least a year between their undergraduate and graduate studies because again, it allows them to get this experience, whether it is volunteering, whether it is internships, whether it is jobs, um, whether it's working at Starbucks, working, you know, as a caregiver, caretaker for someone in their family, especially we saw that happening during the pandemic. Um, these are ways to build that professional experience and ways for students to figure out what they actually, what they think they like and want to do versus what they actually want to do. And I can say from my own experience, that's what happened to me when I graduated from my undergrad. I took a job with, um, an organization and thought I wanted to do one thing, quickly realized that's not where I wanted my life to lead and then went through a whole process of how do I go to graduate school. But definitely getting students to think about getting professional experience uh, even while in undergrad or at least a year be before they apply to graduate school should be kind of, is usually the way we recommend. But we recognize everyone has a different path. So, you know, if students want to go straight to graduate school, that's also possible, but that they will be looking, graduate schools will be looking for some professional experience or some ways that they're showing leadership uh, in their communities uh, through volunteering, being part of organizations and so forth. Um, and on the bottlenecking uh, point, I'll jump to Krista on what she said, right? Not having students totally box themselves in, rolling with the punches and allowing themselves to take opportunities that they may not necessarily think fit them. Uh, is a great way to encourage them again, because like Krista said earlier, they may, they're going to change their minds. We all change our minds. That's just the human response. So allowing them and encouraging them to take courses that they may not necessarily like, courses they may not necessarily feel confident in, you know, volunteering for things that they're not necessarily confident in, this allows them to build experience and allows them to not confine themselves and make themselves, you know, open to outside opportunities so that it's better for them to learn about what possibly graduate school may hold for them. Um, and again, thank you, Daniel. That was a great question. Um, very loaded question, I will say, but uh, thank you again. That was great points that uh, our panelists pointed out. Um, again, like still, we still have a couple of minutes. So please, if you have any other questions, put it in the chat or raise your hand. We would love to hear from you and answer any and all questions you have as advisors. Um, and these two panelists are amazing, so I cannot praise them enough. But while we wait for other questions, I, pers I have a question that I've grappled myself with during my journey uh, into international affairs, but I'm curious to hear from both of you. So you both noted law school as a path that you were both interested in. And I know um, even through my own journey, that was something that I thought I would be interested in. And usually saying to your parents, I'm going to go to law school is pretty safe bet that they will be on board for it. But 
clearly you both are not on the law path right now. You are on the international affairs realm. So I'm just curious to hear from both of you uh, when talking through with your families about how you know, you're pivoting to where your career was, was going. How did that conversation go with your families? Um, how did you describe this path of international affairs that may not often be recognized as a path for families? Just curious how that conversation went with fam with your both of your families and you know how can advisors, if that a student comes to them with this kind of predicament, how are they able to help them navigate these kind of tough conversations? I come from a family that likes for you to have a plan. So for the most part, they were as confident as I was confident. So if I came confident, they were like, okay, you somewhat believe in yourself. <laughs> because they didn't know what international studies was. They didn't know what inter relation, international relations were. They had no idea why I was studying Chinese. I come from a family of teachers and military soldiers. <laughs> and so they were like, what's going on? Um, a lot of times my best bet was relating DOD to State Department and be like, there's similarities here. Are you getting a closer idea of what I'm doing? Um, but sitting down and having those similar conversations of like, this is what I'm doing. This is why I want to do it. I always knew what my end goal was. My end goal was always just to be in the foreign service. It was always the question of just how I was going to do it. For me, I was told the easiest way was international law until I had the conversation with an international lawyer. And she was like, do you want to do you want to do law? And I was like, and then she's like, then you don't need to go to law school. So having a conversation with family is just trying to not persuade them, but sometimes persuading yourself, even you know what you're doing. Because if you know, if you believe in yourself, a lot of times that second half can be easier working with them. Um, and then once you have a clear plan, for my family at least, having a clear plan I always helped them understand what I was doing and help that support. Me. And then sometimes even if your family can't help you, it's going to those outside networks and figuring out what those next steps would be before coming back to your family. Yeah, Krista, I had a very similar experience where I talked to <clears throat> a, an attorney and we had a real conversation about law school and I was like, ah, I'm not like really interested. And they're like, then don't do it. Um, or, you know, do it when you know, apply when you know you're, uh, sure and certain um but i mean i was really interested in i really wanted to be an immigration attorney that was my goal was to be able to help uh migrants uh through uh international law and then i think as i i had a really great experience uh interning with the doj and working with attorneys and um really seeing that that side and um I guess yeah I I had some some conversations and I realized that I can still make an impact especially in the migration field and and help migrants but it not, it doesn't have to be as an attorney maybe you can work uh for a nonprofit and and do uh, other work or maybe even work for UNHCR, um, big, larger IOs, um, but the the role can take a, a variety of, um, of positions. It doesn't just have to be attorney. Um, so I think that was a that was a conversation that made me shift from law school to to grad school. Thank you both. You made some amazing points. Um, I know even my mother doesn't know what international affairs still is, and I've been working in this field. <laughs> I've studied it. I've done my undergrad, graduate school, and it's still a tough conversation to have of what exactly I'm doing. I have to often say, no, I'm not working with the State Department. No, I'm not in government, uh, but I work with government, so that's that's its own thing. Um, and yes, this is it is important. We have a comment of why it's important to have informational interviews. Um, I think encouraging students to talk with alumni, I think a great starting point is even talking to alumni from your their own undergraduate institutions. If there's someone that an advisor knows that can, they can connect with, that can talk to a student about a specific field or specific path, it's always great to connect students with people that are working already in that field so they can really get an understanding of, yes, this is the path I want to go down, or maybe not so much. Um, especially law is one of those paths that 
come up often with students because that's all they know, right? So we actually thank you for even being here today because now you get a little bit more insight into the field of international affairs and that there's paths within law or within international affairs for students that are interested in law, that it's not necessarily law school. Both of our panelists here, like they said, were interested in law school and law, um, but ultimately shifted because they figured out there were ways to work within that field, but with international affairs without getting a law degree specifically. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more time, if there are any other questions, please, you can raise your hand and ask directly. We are, we've got like two more minutes. Um, and Carmen is so gracefully putting some many, many great opportunities in the chat box as well. We will make sure to compile all of these links and send them to you because we know we shared a lot of resources here. Our panelists both shared many resources, both on the funding front, on the graduate school process, uh, careers and so forth that we are so eager to share with you, uh, the advisors here. Okay, well, I don't see any questions. So I think it's okay if we wrap up a minute early. Um, please complete this brief poll that we have that's gonna be launched just for us to get an understanding of ultimately what motivated you and where are ways that we can just better these workshops moving forward. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanna thank uh, Krista. I wanna thank Michelle for attending and giving us their insights um, on their journey into graduate school, their current journey and their future journeys of where they will end up after graduation. Uh, we are so happy to have them part of the AFSIA family. And I know as much as I learned today, you all learned so much from their insights. So uh, just quick round of applause for our panelists today. I do wanna encourage you all to, if you can join us later on today for the Helping Students Link Global Local Connections to Global uh, Interests. Um, both of our panelists today kind of talked a little bit about how they were able to do so, and you're going to get more information on that and more of a brief discussion on that um, at 4 p.m. Eastern time if you're able to join us. Um, again, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you later on today. And if not, hope to see you at another APSIA advisor event. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.